Hey, Icon, Josh here. So we are going to continue in our series in John, looking at John 8. And uh, I, before we get started, I'm going to pray and we're going to kind of jump into things. But I do want to address something uh, that's that's pretty clear in the text. If, if you have your Bible in front of you and you, you went through the scripture reading, you probably noticed that before this text starts, there's these little parentheses around it. And it says, the earliest manuscript, manuscripts do not include uh, 7 verse 53 through 8 verse 11. And uh, I just want to address that real quick because that can be a little bit, little bit confusing and maybe a little bit off-putting or upsetting or, uh, con- yeah, just confusing. And so, uh, you know, Bible scholars have, some of, have the oldest and the largest amount of manuscripts than any other ancient book. Like when it comes to the, the earliest manuscripts and the quality and the amount of those manuscripts, we have a like super abundance of them. When you look at uh, some of the other ancient texts like uh, the Iliad or whatever, like that we've, we don't go to those and question their reliability. Uh, we have very few of those manuscripts and they're actually pretty far removed from when the original thing was actually written. But when it comes to the Bible, we have manuscripts within decades of when it was originally written. And they're in fantastic condition. And so we're able to actually know that the Bible we're reading is what was written. It, it actually per, uh, produces confidence in us. And uh, right here, the Bible scholars are just being transparent, which should actually make us feel really great. And just saying, hey, like this, this story right here isn't included in the original manuscripts, and so we're not sure if it was in the original one. It's not in the earliest ones we have, so we don't know if it was in the original one. But what we do know, the reason they still include it, is because the story that's told here matches a Jesus that we see in the rest of the New Testament. Because there are a lot of things written about Jesus, stories that were told, like the Gospel of Judas or the Gospel of of Mary, some of the stuff you might have seen in like the Da Vinci Code. Why aren't those things included? Because they totally contradict the picture of the rest of the New Testament. The, all of what is included in those earliest, earliest manuscripts. And so it, it just, they're off. But this story tell, tells us and shows us a Jesus that makes total sense for the rest of the New Testament. And so that's why we're going to look at it. Even if it wasn't in the original manuscript, it's a story that, that signifies the heart of Jesus that we already know. And so we're going we're gonna to look at that. First, let me, let me pray and we'll get, we'll get started. Father, I thank you for the way that you come toward us, the way that, you, that Jesus shows how you move toward us. God, I thank you for that, Lord, and I pray that today as we look at this text, that this story would ignite in our heart a sense of confidence about your disposition toward us, God. That we would feel confident and ready to come to you because of what we see about Jesus. Because the truth is, we know who you are based off of what Jesus has done. Jesus is the perfect representation of your own heart. That as you are, so Jesus does. And so the Jesus we see here, the, the, the character, the attributes we see here, give us confidence about you. Would you ignite our hearts today to receive what we have to receive from you, Lord? And Lord, would you unite your power with my weak words and produce fruit here at Icon as a consequence, Lord? Father, we love you and we entrust this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. In the 1930s, there was this really, really strange disaster that happened. And uh, it wasn't really seen before that, and it hasn't really been seen since, at least to the extent that it happened. And so what I'm talking about, of course, is this thing that's traditionally known as the Dust Bowl. Um, that there was a, a series of storms in the, in the Midwest and in the plains that created this crisis where, where dust and dirt got thrown way up into the atmosphere and kind of covered the land so that the, wherever that happened, it was totally unlivable. Not just unlivable, but actually unsafe. And so it, it displaced a lot of families who had to, had to go further out west or go back into the east in order to survive. And what, what we know now is that the reason that happened, the reason the Dust Bowl happened was a combination of two things. First, drought. And then second, uh, irresponsible farming techniques. And so uh, drought, you know, like we can't really control that, especially not in the 1930s. And so they were kind of at the mercy of that. 
But the irresponsible farming techniques, what, what happened is that people from the east were slowly making their way toward the west in, uh, in the 1800s, and they took with them the farming techniques that worked back home where they're from. But, but they, didn't, they didn't adjust for the fact that they were going into a completely new environment that had a completely different type of soil and how to treat it, how to grow it, how to care for it. And so taking those irresponsible farming techniques abused the dirt. <laughs> they used it in a way contrary to how it could actually flourish. And so the dirt, with this mixture of a, a drought and irresponsible farming techniques, got to a point where it had had enough. And it became light, really thin, really, really easy to be picked up in the high winds that are common in that area. The dirt had had enough. It had reached its limit of drought and irresponsible farming techniques. And, and I think human beings, like, like the dirt from which we were taken, also have a limit. Also have a capacity that we can, we can only take so much of life or of, of our own sin, that each of us has a, a time in life where because of our own sin or because of the sins of others, we come to a point where we reach our limit, our capacity to cope, our ability to get through, our, our eagerness to hope about a better life, life after this season is totally tapped out. It doesn't feel like we can, we can cope anymore, like we can make it through this. We've reached our limit. All of us have this, this time where we've had enough. And though, though the, the experience of that varies at all, it's all the same sigh of exhaustion, right? Like, I've had enough of the negatives on these pregnancy tests. I've had enough of this marriage in which we, we are putting forward this air that we're doing great, but in reality, we're drowning in lost trust and in conflict. I've had enough of my singleness. I'm so sick of feeling like I'm alone. I want to share my life closely, intimately, deeply with another human being. I've had enough of this baby not sleeping. I've had enough of this, this wayward child that refuses to heed my loving counsel. I've had enough of the objectifying glances of the opposite sex that communicate to me my worth is only found in what I might provide for them, how they see me. And the one that we can all come together and know deeply, painfully, is I've had enough of this sin, of my sin. I've had enough of myself. Each of us come to this place where we are tired and we are, we are drained of our capacity to hold it together anymore. What, what do we need in that moment? What, what, what do we need? What do we want to help get us through that? I think what we need is mercy. We want mercy. We want someone who will come toward us in, in a way that doesn't, that doesn't just try to fix us, but actually comes toward us in a meaningful way and reminds us that this season will relent and will come towards you with, with a heart of assurance, a heart of safety, not coming to you trying to figure out what's going wrong or why you're in such pain, not just trying to fix you, but actually come toward you see you, what you're feeling, knowing what you're feeling, and assure you that in, the, in that person's presence, you are safe. We want mercy when we've reached our limit. And this is exactly the type of mercy that Jesus wants to provide us. That he knows our condition well. He knows the ways that we've been tapped out. He knows the way that our sin has exhausted us, the ways that sin, sin deforms us into what we were out of what we were made to be. He knows that, and he knows what that creates in our hearts, and he moves toward us with mercy, with a certain type of mercy. 
And my hope for you today, as we, as we look at this story, as we look at this text, is that you would see that your ideas about the mercy of Jesus are probably far too low than what it actually is. That the mercy of Jesus is not just sentimental. The mercy of Jesus transforms everything. It's rich. It's deep. It revives the dead soul. His mercy is wonderful, far more than we dare to imagine. And so we're going to look at the mercy of Jesus today in this story. And I, and I want us to see just a few things about his mercy. And it's, it's this. Number one. The mercy of Jesus restores our dignity. Number two, the mercy of Jesus relieves our fear. And number three, the mercy of Jesus creates a response. So restores, relieves, and creates a response. Let's look at this. Chapter 8, verse 1. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. So think about what's going on in this story. That this woman has been totally singled out. That even the law that they reference here in the Old Testament says that it should bring that they should bring the man and the woman to bring to, to stand trial. But they say, oh, it's just the woman. They have singled her out. She's the one being called out. And she's the one being singled out as, as the sinner, as the adulteress. She is being exposed. She's being exposed and singled out. But not only that, there, there's there's no reason to think in this text that the Pharisees and the leaders actually gave this woman time to get her things together after being caught in the act of adultery. And so this woman is entering into a situation, not even willingly, but being taken, singled out, standing naked and afraid. She stands in the middle of this crowd. She's probably confused about what's going on Things have moved really quickly, but what she does know is she's not safe. She's not dignified in this moment. And what's even more grievous is that the Pharisees and the scribes, they do not take this woman, they do not single her out for the sake of of upholding the Old Testament law that they were singling out in that moment. The, The text says that. That's not why they were doing it. They were doing it in order that they might test Jesus. It was all, this woman was, she was not a person. She was a tool. She was someone to be used in their scheme of backing Jesus into a corner so that they could have a charge to bring against him. This woman is no longer a human being. She's simply a tool in their sinister sinister scheme to trap Jesus, to try to come up with something that they can charge him with. And so here's this woman with her head hanging low, being singled out, being exposed both physically and emotionally, relationally, standing in the midst of this crowd, knowing the gazes, knowing the eyes that are on her and what they're thinking. That she's the one. She's the sinner. Yeah, she deserves to die, is what this crowd is thinking. She's been singled out. She's been robbed of her her dignity. What is Jesus' response? How how does Jesus respond in this? Look at this. This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. So here's the situation where this woman has been shamed, she's been, her dignity has been robbed of her. All the eyes in the crowd are looking at her, knowing who she is, and she's probably wondering, what is my life going to look like after this? I've been exposed as a sinner. Here she is, undignified more than ever, and what does Jesus do? He 
he bends down. He looks away, and he starts just to kind of doodle in the sand. And there's a lot of speculation about what he was writing in the sand, and maybe he was writing the sins of all the other people in the crowd. That doesn't matter. What matters is what Jesus is trying to do in this moment. Jesus refuses to contribute to the eyes that are on this woman that are meant to shame her, that are meant to take her dignity away. Jesus is not going to look at this woman yet. He will in a moment, but he won't, he won't look at this woman yet because he knows that she might interpret his gaze and not be able to read it to, to really make her panic of like, oh no, he's looking, he's adding to the, he's thinking what everyone else is thinking. No, Jesus refuses to participate. Jesus says, no, I will not participate in the objectification and the shaming and the isolation of this woman. Instead, I will turn. I will turn away. I will not contribute to this woman's shame. I will not contribute to the process, the the scheme that's going on here that's using this woman as a tool rather than as a human being. I will not participate in that. So he just starts writing with his fingers, looking away so that she might not be all the more shamed, all the more dignified, undignified. And not only that, but Jesus gives a teaching after they kind of poke and prod him and say, hey, are you going to answer us or what? Are you just going to write in the sand? Jesus says one sentence, and it's, it's genius. It's genius. He says, let the first of you who is without sin be the first one to throw the stone. So Jesus responds, but he responds with a brilliant sentence that he knows, if anyone has some self-awareness here, is going to clear the crowd. He, he's, he's brilliantly, with genius and with love, saying something that is actually going to solve this woman's problem in this moment, that's going to diffuse the situation. It's going to clear the crowd. It's going to send all of these shaming gazes away from this woman. And then, then, he stands up and he looks at her. Jesus doesn't just say a teaching that clears the crowd, and then he's like, okay, now she's safe, I'm just going to walk away. Jesus actually stands up. He doesn't leave her. He doesn't leave after everyone's gone and just knowing that she's probably okay now, she's not going to be stoned to death. Just, you know, go off and live your life. No, Jesus engages with her. As a human being, he stands up and he looks at her. He interacts with her. He engages her in her most embarrassing and terrifying moment. Jesus' mercy restores our dignity, engages us as a human being, that we're not just this. We're not just whatever sin it is that you are caught in, that you are struggling with. You're not just that. You're a human being worthy of being interacted with, of being engaged in that moment of shame. Jesus' mercy restores our dignity. Where have you been undignified? Have you been used in, in the scheme of some other sinister plot? some other's sinful scheme? Have you been, have you experienced that isolation, that singling out, being undignified before a crowd, whether in person or even on social media? Jesus wants to restore your sense of dignity. And Jesus knows what you need. That Jesus knew what this woman needed. That's why he didn't look, that's why he gave the teaching, and that's why he re-engaged. He knows perfectly, personally, how to engage us when we have lost our sense of dignity. Jesus restores that. Jesus comes in to restore that, personally tailored for us because he knows us. He knows what we're feeling, and he knows how to change the situation. Next, Jesus, in his mercy, relieves us from our fear. Think about this. Watch this, okay? Okay. But when they heard it, and and, uh, once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, when they heard Jesus' teaching, they they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. It's funny, that's how it always happens. The, The oldest seemed to know themselves best. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? 
She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Jesus, think about what was going on in the, in the thought life of this woman. Not only was she undignified before a crowd, but she, I mean, her day started off weird. She started her day and then she got in this act of adultery that was really terrible and was sinful. Then all of a sudden she's getting snatched away. She's, she's still naked. She doesn't know what's going on. And she's brought into this crowd and she's afraid. She's undignified. She feels shamed. But then she comes in and she sees, oh my gosh, is, is this the one they've called Jesus? Who she's probably heard about by now. She's probably heard that this man is a supposed prophet who, who cares a lot about the righteousness of God, about the holiness of God, who lives a life of righteousness. And this is the one who's going to hold her trial? This is the one who's going to express a verdict in her, in her sin? In her trial? In her case, what's going to happen? She, prob she probably panicked. She probably felt in her mind, with her head hanging low, she's wondering, when is she going to feel the first sting of that stone? When's it going to happen? She, don't, she doesn't want to make eye contact with anyone else there. So she's just looking at the ground. So she has no idea when she's going to feel that first sting. She is panicking. She has no idea how this situation is going to go. What does Jesus do? He says, has no one condemned you? Neither do I condemn you. And imagine the, the relief. Imagine that it's almost confusing as she's watched this crowd disperse. What she thought was going to be a, a, the death knell for her socially, well, at least now it's not a death knell for my life. And Jesus says, all these other people, if they had the, the awareness to show you mercy, I'm going to show you mercy all the more. Imagine the relief that she's left alone with just this one person, the only person there who actually had the right as the one who is the Holy One of God, who is the Messiah, the Christ, the one who has come into the world to, to do God's will, if anyone there had a right to throw a stone, it would have been Jesus. So even as the crowd is dispersed, she must be wondering, while she's watching Jesus still doodling on the ground, what's going to be his reaction when he stands up? And he stands up and he looks at her. And he says, neither do I condemn you. In other words, you are safe. You are safe. Don't be afraid. And here, Jesus shows us something about God that the rest of the Bible shows that, that God's mercy is wonderful. <laughs> we, we often think that his mercy is kind of reluctant, that Jesus kind of almost in this story kind of stands up and is like, well, no one else condemned you, so I guess I can't. That's not what Jesus is doing. Jesus, in his heart, his mercy lunges out at toward us, one, wants to come at us and consume us with pardon and forgiveness and a sense of relief. In fact, when, when you look at the Bible, we, we often think that, that, that God, his, his natural work, what he does most naturally, what he wants to do most is judgment. And that the weird thing he does, the thing that kind of goes against what he wants to do is mercy. So, so judgment is God's natural work and mercy is his strange work. It's totally backwards. In fact, when you look at the Bible, across the whole scriptures, you see a God who cares deeply about sin, who punishes the sinner, who takes the standard of his holiness and righteousness without reservation. He knows, he knows the standard by which we are to live. And he holds us to that standard. And there will be sinners who perish. And yet every time, like there's so many moments in the scripture where God's talking about judgment in such a way that he's basically saying, I wish we could have done it another way. 
And he will do, he will perform judgment. He will perform and exercise the standard of conduct that God has. And by God's grace, we'll, we'll talk about that mercy that we have and forgiveness through Jesus. But God does not take sin lightly, but every time. It's, it's like God's letting us into his heart to see that there, it even says in the New Testament that he does not desire that any sinner should perish. And so although God will perform justice, there's something in his heart that's like, I wish we could have done this another way. I wish this could have ended differently. I will hold the standard up, but I wish you would have received my mercy. I wish you would have come to me for mercy. Because the rest of the scriptures also show a God in his, when, he, when it comes to showing mercy, he waits to do it. He's on the edge of his seat to give mercy. And so with judgment, there's almost this re- uh, like holy reluctance in God to be like, I will perform this, but I wish it kind of got another way. And then when it's mercy, he's just like, it's like a shotgun. It's just going everywhere, hoping that someone will receive it. He's, he's generous with his mercy. There is, he does it with his whole heart. There's nothing in God that is holding him back, that is kind of pulling him back to slow things down when it comes to showing mercy. That's what Jesus shows us. That's what the scriptures show us. And so because of that, we don't have to panic. The mercy of Jesus can relieve our panic. We often think that Jesus is the last person we can bring our sin to. Like, yeah, we live this whole Christian life, but really we're afraid of Jesus because we think he's reluctant in his mercy. But he's not. He's not. God's mercy is excited to be expressed. His mercy is waiting to come towards you so as to diffuse the situation and restore your dignity, but also to give you relief in your panic that there's no, because of Jesus Christ and his mercy, there is no reason for you to be afraid in the presence of God. Think about that. (laughs) Think about the relief that that would bring to your life if you believed in your bones that the safest place for you to be is in the presence of God. That is a a mercy far more wonderful than any of us would have dared imagine, but nonetheless, it is the truth that Scripture puts forth. His mercy is more. Finally, The mercy of Jesus creates a response. The mercy of Jesus creates a response in us. What is that? Jesus says to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. What's going on there? Is Jesus just kind of, you know, tacking on some legalism because he's afraid that the mercy he's shown her is going gonna, is gonna to make her just go have all the affairs in the world? No. I think what Jesus is doing here is that he, he's providing an insight for the woman. He's providing an insight that she, that, so that she can see, hey, the experience of restoration and of relief that I've just given you, if you receive that, that's going to do some things to your heart. I'm not just telling you to go and like, hey, don't do that again, please. He's saying, if you'll receive it, if you'll really take this in, that is going to create a response in your heart of repentance. Not because you're resolved of like, oh man, I can't really do that again, but it changes our desires. The mercy of God changes our desires as it comes toward us and rescues us and relieves us. That creates a response in us so that when the moment comes up, so that when this woman goes back into the city, is walking about in the markets and sees that man who wasn't singled out, sees that man, she'll in that moment think, that's not the route. That's not the good life. Whatever sort of affirmation or pleasure or whatever I was getting from that affair is not what I want because I've experienced the mercy of Jesus. And it has thrilled my heart. It has, it has picked me back up and set me on a solid rock. I have my feet underneath me again for the first time in however long I can remember. 
Jesus' mercy is meant to create a, resp- a response in us. To, to think that this man, this God-man is so sympathetic towards us that, that as Revelation talks about, it describes Jesus' complexion as, as uh, like Jasper and Carnelian, that that man's face would squint in sympathy towards you. That does some things to you. That creates something in your heart that you remember again for the first time in however long that you can make it through, that there's a way forward. If Jesus has been this merciful to me, if Jesus has restored my sense of dignity, if Jesus has calmed and relieved my panic, then that tells me that I can keep going. That even if what we need is the the mercy that comes toward us in our suffering and we're exhausted, we can can know in that moment that there's a way forward. That yeah, the season is still here and it's still terrible. It's still gut-wrenchingly painful. But this mercy that I've received from Jesus has thrilled my heart paradoxically in the hardest of times, in the most difficult of places. And that tells me that I can keep moving forward. That tells me in my sin that I can get back up, that this is not the end for me, that my story won't be defined by this, but rather it will be defined by a God who is merciful, who meets me in the deepest of sin, who meets me in the most difficult of suffering. And and speaks words of assurance, of love, of comfort, who comes at us in that way, that, that can give us some life back into our bones. And we can get back up. To close, I just want to ask a couple questions. Where do you need the mercy of restoration right now? Where do you need the mercy of relief for your fears? Like, where, where, where are you most in need of Jesus coming in and providing the relief of mercy? Or maybe, maybe a, a more pointed question here. How about, how about this? In your worst moments of, of sin and exhaustion, what do you think Jesus is towards you in that moment? Like, you've just screwed it up again. You, again, you've, you've, you've taken out your exhaustion and your anger on your children, and you know they didn't deserve it, and you took it out on them. You were angry. You yelled again at them, and it pains your heart. You have again become the source of division in your marriage. You're the one who drew first blood. You have again run to this relationship in order to solve the problem of isolation and loneliness, even though you know it ends in bitterness. You you have again looked at that on the computer. In that moment, in the worst crisis of your sin and of your suffering, if Jesus walks into that room, what's the look on his face? Like, Like in your imagination, What look does Jesus have on his face? Is it one of frustration, of tiredness, a sense of regret that he ever entered in and ever tried a relationship with you, finally coming to terms that this person is hopeless? Or is Jesus Jesus getting down and, and his face has the safest of eyes? His brow squinting in sympathy, locking eyes with you and communicating, dear child, I am displeased with what's happening here, but not just because of what's happening here, but because of you, because I love you. And so he comes to you with mercy. He comes into the room and he picks you up and he takes you out of that room, squeezing you tighter and tighter to know you are are safe. That's the mercy of Jesus. My, one of my biggest fears for you, Icon, 
is to make it feel, to, for you to not believe in the safety of Jesus. That you would panic. That you would panic and, and, and react in that panic and walk away from Jesus. Like the other day, I was, uh, so I have, I have a three-year-old daughter and uh, so at our house, we have in our bathroom our bathtub, but it doesn't have one of like the drain plugs. And as the staff here knows, I love my bubble baths. And so uh, we had to fix that. So the way that we did, we just took one of the, like a little bath rag and uh, like p- plugged it into the, the little drain hole for whenever I need to take a bath. So it works great. Um, the, the other day, <laughs> I was walking through the hall and I kind of look into the bathroom for a moment and I see my three-year-old daughter with that little rag just going like sucking the water out of it. And in the moment, I was like, no, don't do that. That's, that's disgusting. Please don't do that. And the way that she reacted broke my heart. Because she, she dropped the rag and just went like that. Just like, and she's always, she's always had this piece of her that whenever she does get in trouble, or even if it's just she's not in trouble, but she feels like she's done something wrong, she just, you can tell in her heart, she's someone who might feel shame more prevalently Hopefully not because of anything we've done. I've been incredibly assuring of her. And that's what broke my heart. Is because in that moment, I wasn't coming in to, to condemn her. I was just trying to take the rag out of her mouth because it's really gross. And I didn't want those germs in her mouth. A lot of us panic like that naturally. And my hope for you is that because of the mercy of Jesus, you would know that the safest place in the world is under his gaze. That when he walks into the room, that when he walks into the moment, into the crisis, into the deepest moments of sin, he's there to show mercy. My fear is that you would be afraid to go to Jesus. That you, Icon, you would would live this Christian life where you're you're going to church and you're going to community group, you're going to Icon group, but, but deep down, in your life with God and before God, you would be afraid to go to Jesus. My, my fear is that, that we understand the skeletal structures of salvation by faith alone, but we don't get that behind those structures is a beating heart of Jesus ready to show us mercy. And so friends, remember again, receive again, in your place of fear, in your place of needed restoration, that the mercy of Jesus comes to you there. And because of that, the safest place in the world, no matter where you're tapped out on, whether it's with yourself, with your sin, or with others, no matter where you've reached your limit, the mercy of Jesus can restore and relieve you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your mercy, God, the the ways in which you've shown us in Jesus exactly what your heart is like toward us. God, I just say really clearly and with eagerness, God, that you would banish from our minds, from our hearts, from our thinking, the satanic thought that the last place we should be with our sin is at the feet of Jesus. Wherever that is in us, Wherever that's messing with us and taking us away from you, God, take it out and replace it with a sense of confidence that the mercy of Jesus is more. That sentence holds true in all of life, God. Help us to believe it, Father. To be refreshed, to be thrilled again, able to move forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we are going to go into a time of response. And we do the same things every week. And at first we're going to do a time of silence. And, and in this time of silence, I want you to reflect. What, it, what, it, what is the mercy that you need? Where have you reached your limit? Where has your capacity to cope been dwarfed by the problems of life or by the sin of your own heart? Where do you need the mercy of Jesus to come in? And then after that, we're going we're gonna to give. We, we want to respond to the generosity of God's mercy with generosity. Because we know that we see these people on a day-by-day basis who are walking in exhaustion, who have been isolated, who have been shamed, who do feel a sense of panic of what's going to happen to me because I can't get all my life together. 
the, those people in that panic, they have no idea that there could ever be a God who's merciful towards them. And we want them to hear it, and so we give. And then finally, we're going to take communion. We're going to remember that the mercy of God is not based on some subjective feeling within him, but is demonstrated by the objective sacrifice of Jesus Christ himself. And so we're going to take the bread, we're going to take the blood, and we're going to know that Jesus will not abandon us in his mercy. He didn't abandon us on the cross, so how would he abandon us now? And we'll receive the mercy that we need. Let's do that now.